in our federal obligation to have a lecture marking Constitution Day, uh, which the government requires of us in order to receive government funds as a college. Um, <laughs> which is also, according to some constitutional scholars, itself unconstitutional, Constitution Day. Yes, well, <laughs> that's the next lawsuit to, to test that. Um, in any case, uh, there was a, uh, a case that happened a little while ago that some of you heard of called Citizens United. Um, there's, uh, I guess, FEC, right? Um, Federal Election Committee. And it came out and it caused a stir, as many of you know. And um, I was looking around for uh, s some writings on it that were not just the normal, it stinks kind of writing. Um, and I came across an article called The Historical Roots of Citizens United versus the FEC. How Anarchists and Academics Accidentally Created Corporate Speech Rights. Um, at the same time, I was teaching a course on anarchism here at Bard, and uh, I was getting ready to give a lecture on um, Citizen United and censorship in Berlin, at, at ECLA in Berlin at, at State of the World Week. And so uh, I read this article, and it really was, um, you know, every, every once in a while you come across an article in the academic world that is not mind-numbing. Um, and this one was not just mind-numbing, it was really good. And um, since that time, it's been a goal of mine to bring Zephyr Teachout uh, here at Bard to uh, speak to us about this really good, um, thoughtful, wide-ranging um, uh, approach to, um, to campaign finance reform and to Citizens United. Um, some of you know that Zephyr Teachout uh, was one of the driving forces behind the really innovative uh, internet campaign, of Howard Dean's campaign in 2004. Um, she's now a professor, or associate professor, at Fordham Law School. Um, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you here to Bard. Thank you very much. such a pleasure to come here. I took the train up, which is beautiful. I, I got to meet Roger, which is very exciting. And it is especially exciting to speak at the, a red center, which I just mispronounced for the last time. Roger has explained it is the Arendt Center. Arendt. Arendt. Sort of like, isn't? Is that? No, Arendt. Arendt, yeah. Uh, and my goal on this Constitution Day is to convince you that uh, the First Amendment is a terrible thing. <laughs> Not quite, but something along those lines. Um, that uh, at very different times in U.S. constitutional history, different clauses of the Constitution have become axes wielded by those in power. The Contracts Clause, the Due Process Clause, and right now I see the First Amendment as playing a similar and dangerous role, and especially dangerous because, I made a few of you laugh, and I said I wanted to convince you we're going to get rid of the First Amendment, because there's a taboo around the First Amendment. There's a sense that of all the amendments, this is one that we all agree on. If I say, I take a cautious view of the Sixth Amendment, you might not kick me out of your dinner party. Or I take a, I, I take a conservative attitude towards the Fourth Amendment. Same thing. If I say, I, I take a conservative attitude, I think we might have gone a little bit far on free speech. That sort of grounds to not introduce me to your mother. You know, this is sort of a, and, and wherever there are taboos, that's where interesting things tend to be happening in political society, I think. So, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to tell you a story. And then I am going to talk about the First Amendment and the rise of the First Amendment and talk about why it troubles me. And then, if we have time, talk, talk a little bit about an example of an area where we might think differently about what I think is a very important policy question if we didn't have this tyrannical um, First Amendment. Um, just so you don't shut me out entirely, I, I do think the First Amendment is a good thing. I just think its current role is a little overblown. So here's the story. It's 1871, and uh, old man has... Um, lent to the U.S. government $15,000 in 1871 dollars, which is, you know, upwards of over $100,000 in contemporary money. He lives in Virginia. He's sick, 
and he wants to come back. He's written a letter, nothing's coming. So he hires a lawyer. And he says, Dear Mr. Childs, will you please go to Washington, D.C. and speak to members of Congress and get my money back? And the lawyer says, sure. They sign a contract. He goes to Washington. He talks to members of Congress. He writes letters. He meets staffers. He gets the money back. Oh, you want me to stand in one place? <laughs> I'm not going to sneak out. <laughs> Um, and he gets the money back. He, he dies, and his son then sues on the contract, says, you promised to pay me if I got your $100,000 back. And the old man, sick man, says, I'd prefer not to. So far, it'll be a joke for those of you. <laughs> but, um, I prefer not to. And the guy says, what are you talking about? You owe me this money. And he says, no, no, no. You're a lobbyist, and I don't have to pay you. Um, and the case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. This is the uh, lawyer, son of the lawyer, says, this is like we made a contract for a car, and you said, I just don't want to pay for the car now that I've gotten the car. And the old man says, no, this is like we made a contract for prostitution. And you cannot go to the cops after we made a contract for prostitution and get them to enforce that contract. Because lobbying is like prostitution. It is so corrupt that there's no way courts are going to enforce it. So, it goes up to the Supreme Court. The lawyer argues, look, he had a right, a constitutional right, to personally petition Congress. Therefore, if he had that personal right to go to Congress, he certainly had the right to hire somebody, to pay him to go to Congress, to speak for him. And the Supreme Court says, no, we are not going to enforce this contract. But while an individual can petition Congress on his own behalf, they cannot pay a third party to do so. The foundation of the ruling was the idea that paid political petitioning, and in particular, named it as lobbying, was against the public policy of the United States. The practice of paying someone else to make your political arguments would undermine the moral fabric of the um, country, of civic society. It would lead to distorted power arrangements. Citizens' virtue, according to this court, is the foundation of a republic. And if you make that up for, if you put that up for sale, um, you are undermining the fa that foundation. Citizens are at once sovereigns and subjects. Citizens have a duty to be truthful in their interaction with public officials. They may not be truthful, but we as a court are not going to enforce a contract where somebody is speaking for somebody else's political, um, uh, in somebody else's political voice. And moreover, if an individual is allowed to lobby, what would happen, says the court, if we allow corporations to lobby? This is a um, direct quote. If any of the great corporations of the country were allowed to hire adventurers <laughs> to make market of themselves, to procure the passage of a general law with a view to their promotion of a private interest, the moral sense of every right-minded man would instinctively denounce the employer and employed as steeped in corruption and the employment as infamous. In other words, everybody knows that corporations hiring lobbyists is corrupt and against the public policy of the United States. The court in this sees its role as limiting the temptation of private citizens. It says, in this case, there's no evidence that anybody bribed anyone. But if you put people in these kinds of situations where you can pay them to get legislation passed, you're going to start seeing bribery happen even if we don't get to see the um, particular instances. And so we're not even going to allow the what they call the inchoate step. We're not going to allow um, uh, people to put themselves in that situation. So, there are a few things that are remarkable and interesting about this case. The first is that there was nothing remarkable about it, about it at the time. 
So if you went to any state court in the country and asked what was the result going to be in this case, they would have said, they're not going to enforce the contract. This was child's lawyer was going out on a limb trying to enforce this contract. Every state had, um, had every state that I've looked at has similar cases where courts have refused to enforce corrupt contracts. Um, and uh, Georgia had in its 1877 constitution uh, criminalized lobbying um, as part of the constitution that was only recently taken out. Um, it was criminal, although a different variation in California and several other states. The second remarkable thing about this case is that nobody mentions the First Amendment. It's not there. It's not that child's lawyer mentions it and he loses. He mentions similar kinds of concerns. Well, you have a right to petition Congress, uh, but he doesn't mention free speech. The idea of free expression is never once in the opinion or in any of the related opinions. So this case is now unimaginable. Right now, if you take any case involving politics, the first thing that the court is going to go to is speech. That has become the lens through which we do our political philosophy. Uh, and I gave you the examples of the quote talking about the citizen's virtue as a different kind of way a court can do political philosophy. You're always engaged in political philosophy when you're engaging in questions of politics and, and uh, the court examining what's happening in the states. Um, the question is, how do you do that? What do you think is the tool? Um, where we are now, to briefly review, in the last 10 years, the court um, basically uses the First Amendment to do all kinds of things, not just political philosophy. In 1911, Montana passed, uh, in response to um, a mining company owning 90% of the, the uh, press and a, a lot of the public officials in the state, um, Montana passed a law forbidding corporations from um, uh, independently spending money around elections. The Supreme Court struck it down without discussion this year, using the First Amendment. In 1947, Congress passed a law banning corporate expenditures in campaigns. That's uh, the core of the law that was struck down in Citizens United. And I'll return to that with the First Amendment as the tool that was used to cut down that law. But it's not just in that kind of politics. In 1999, uh, Massachusetts had a regulation that were concerned about kids smoking. So they passed a regulation saying you cannot have um, smokeless tobacco below five feet. Let's see. Below five feet. <laughs> You can sell smokeless tobacco above five feet, but not below five feet, and you can't smell, sell uh, smokeless tobacco within a thousand feet of schoolyards. Struck down because of the First Amendment. In uh, 2005, California passed a law forbidding uh, minors, forbidding uh, companies from selling minors games that include killing, ma maiming, dismembering, or sexually assaulting a human being. Last year, this California law struck down by the First Amendment. 2006, this is, uh, these are all tricky cases, but this one is particularly fun. 2006, Congress passed a law that made it a crime for people to falsely claim um, that they had won a Medal of Honor. Uh, and uh, this past year, the Supreme Court says we can't say that there's no political value in a lie. So, struck down because of the First Amendment. <laughs> so, I'm not saying these are easy cases, but what you see is that across the board, the First Amendment has become the way that the court is managing all a huge array of decisions that are made by localities, difficult decisions. How did this happen? Very briefly, um, this First Amendment was basically invented um, by um, justices that I have a lot of respect for, um, uh, Brandeis, Holmes. Um, there were a series of cases in the, uh, in the teens, twenties, um, involving anarchists, 
um, and those who were concerned about the militarization of America and who had different political views than the uh, mainstream. Um, and in those series of cases, the anarchists lost. So 1917, Emma Goldman, uh, who you hopefully know, a writer and activist, uh, was arrested and sentenced to two years in prison for making speeches and distributing newspapers, um, encouraging people not to register for the draft. Um, her lawyers objected to the sentence. Well, it's 1917, they've read Trist, they know what, what role the First Amendment plays, uh, free speech plays in um, our constitutional history at that point. They do not raise a uh, free speech defense to the charge. They do raise a First Amendment um, defense to the charge, claiming that it was in violation of her free exercise of uh, religion, uh, because the different people could object to, could refuse to join the draft for religious reasons as opposed to non-religious reasons. Um, and the Supreme Court says, we aren't even going to listen to that argument. We aren't even going to talk about that argument that there's a sentence, because it's so obviously wrong. So, first uh, anarchist attempt, totally shut down. Um, and then there's this similar dismissiveness for the next several years. Uh, the court upholds sentences of up to 20 years for anarchists who are distributing leaflets. Um, five year sentences, uh, I mean, these are serious, they're serious now, but at the time, these are really substantial penal sentences. 20-year sentences, five-year sentences for publishing um, German language newspapers. Um, a Communist Party leader was uh, her conviction was upheld for an effort to create a revolutionary working class movement. Um, hardly something that one would think of as dangerous in today's society. So the majority of the court is going along with these convictions, but um, Justice Brandeis. And then Justice Brandeis and Holmes start dissenting. And they have these really beautiful dissents in which they're talking about the importance of free speech and how essential free speech is to the working of a democracy. Um, in this, they are basically inventing a new idea for the role that free expression should play in a democracy. What you see is gradually, because they're both wonderful writers, uh, these dissent, dissents start to appeal to <coughs> opinions, and even in majority opinions where convictions are upheld, there's a new recognition that they're not going to dismiss it like they did the Emma Goldman case. They're really going to take seriously this First Amendment idea and the idea of free, ex uh, free expression. Uh, finally, um, you see in uh, 1941, um, uh, not only are the is, are the free speech cases starting to win, but you start to see something else happen, which is that the justices uh, are not just talking about free speech as an important principle for, um, for a democracy, but as the most important principle, first, of the Bill of Rights. So you remember there's a constitution and the Bill of Rights. The first step is to say the most important Bill of Rights, the Bill of, the Bill of Rights, is the um, First Amendment. And you see that in the 1941 case. And then the next step, is you see a movement from the most important part of the Bill of Rights to the most important part of the Constitution. Um, there's a, the left, there's an interesting interplay here in the 30s and 40s and 50s between the left and the right, but the right started off pretty resistant to this free speech notion, and the left said, no, we got the ideas. The right's trying to shut down ideas. We got the ideas. If we can just get these ideas out there, we're going to win the war of ideas. Um, I don't even like using that expression. I, it shows how socialized I have become. But we're going to win this um, battle if we can just take the top off and get rid of these censorship laws and other laws. Um, throughout the 30s and 40s, basically, the right is resistant. And then you start seeing a change in the 50s and 60s. Um, Brandenburg versus Ohio is sometimes called the coronation of the First Amendment. Um, so Brandenburg versus Ohio, a Nazi leader. Um, a Nazi leader was in Ohio, uh, sorry, Klan leader, Klan leader, uh, in Ohio um, was, uh, got a rally filmed showing men in robes and hoods, um, burning a cross, making speeches, 
Um, one of the speakers talked about the possibility of revenge against the Jews and the niggers. Um, and it announced a a plans for a march on Washington. Um, he was charged with advocating violence. This is a 1969 case. Um, a unanimous Supreme Court overturned that conviction without discussion. Um, and uh, it's not actually an example of a case where you see a lot of the elevation of the First Amendment, but it shows where the court had gotten to by 69. And one of the things is the right started buying into the First Amendment. This is now a unanimous decision. And it's in the late 60s and early 70s where you also see, and they have a bunch of new ideas. There's a lot of, look, maybe the left's really wrong. Look what's happening in the Soviet Union. We have the new ideas. The, um, the, there's some problems with the, the old left. We're going to open up. We can win this battle place of ideas. And then there's also the development of um, corporate interest in speech rights and an understanding in the late 60s, early 70s that possibly this is a way that, we, that, that corporations can use to um, expand their own power relative to the state. So just to give you a few examples of um, what happens after 69, um, the scholars across the political spectrum really get on board with this idea of the free speech constitution. Um, I'm going to give you a few examples of what they've said. Free speech is the paradigmatic liberty through which one participates in a democracy. It's constitutional instantiation. You know, it's a scholar because they're using the word instantiation. Uh, it's constitutional instantiation. The First Amendment becomes identified with democratic pluralism itself. So there, here's a logical line. Free speech is democracy. Um, Owen Fiss, who's a wonderful First Amendment scholar, says there's a sense that the First Amendment is not a technical legal rule but rather an organizing principle of society central to our self-understanding. It has a special place or exception reserved for speech. Now this, of course, then has an effect on popular opinion as well. Um, I don't know if this resonates with you guys, but um, the uh, First Amendment Center, which has its own interest, uh, gets uh, people to rank amendments, sort of a fun game. Um, and Americans routinely identify um, free speech um, for to, as the purpose of the First Amendment. They sort of know what this is, they know what the First Amendment is, four to six times more than you know what any other amendment is. So everything else has sort of become secondary in the popular imagination as well. Um, what this means, as I've suggested before, is that all these debates through, happen through this lens. I have a friend who is... Um, arguing a Supreme Court case next month on uh, government spying. Um, I suspect that what you'll see is that in a government spying case, that the bulk of the arguments are going to be about the First Amendment. Now, you may or may not remember the Fourth Amendment, which protects people against unreasonable search and seizures, but um, the strategic thing to do in these cases is go to the court with the first, uh, you're looking puzzled, Go, go to the, okay. uh, I, I, I know I'm, I'm talking to a non-law audience, so I want to make sure I, I make sense on this, and you can ask questions. But there's a Fourth Amendment that says that you're protected against unreasonable search and seizures. There's a First Amendment that says you have free expression. The government's spying on you. Who, which clause of the Constitution would you think would be the clause you might use? You might say, I don't think there should be unreasonable search and seizures, including government spying on me. But the First Amendment has become so central to what the um, consensus is on the court that it probably is going to make more strategic sense to focus on the First Amendment and say it violates their expression rights to have the government spy on you <laughs> than to use the Fourth Amendment as uh, it violates your Fourth Amendment rights to be spied upon. Um, in the voting area where I work, the uh, there's an effort to make show that voting is a First Amendment right. Because if you can show that voting is a First Amendment right, then maybe you have a better chance of winning the voter ID cases. So just across the board, whatever you have, if you can shoehole that into the First Amendment, maybe you have a better chance than if you use some other part of the um, Constitution. Um, for the most part, the left has accepted this. And the right has embraced it with glee. 
Um, the left is accepted, and what that means is that the debates about other values that you might have, like equality, are had through the avenue of the First Amendment. Or if you're interested in civic participation, you'll try to shoehorn that, shoehorn that and say, well, the, the right has the wrong understanding of the First Amendment. They should have this different understanding of the First Amendment. The First Amendment really means that everybody needs an equal voice. And so that it's, there, there's a, a left-wing discussion of equal voice, but it's had through what I think is a pretty cramped um, lens. Um, so, what's wrong with this? Um, I mean, the cases that I read you, I'm terribly sympathetic to, right? <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I mention the First Amendment, that happens. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm horrified that political pamphleteering was criminalized. I'm thrilled that Brandeis had these dissents. I absolutely want to defend the right of um, Brandenburg to uh, make his speeches. Um, but what has happened, I think, is that it's gotten, uh, it's gotten disproportionate. The most obvious effect is what's happened in the political speech area. So, in Buckley versus Vallejo, um, which is one of the weirdest opinions. It was a per curiam opinion, which also means that everybody joined, you don't get independent voices on it. It was written really quickly. Um, it sort of lacks internal consistency, and nobody likes it. People on the left don't like it, people on the right don't like it, but it has become the foundation of how we deal with political cases. It's the case that um, in 1976, reviewed a whole series of campaign finance laws from the post-Watergate era and said some of these are going to be allowed, some of these aren't going to be allowed. Without getting into the weeds, there's a few important things it did. It um, said that money is speech. So here you see an example of very creative lawyers saying, well, if we can convince people that spending money is a form of political speech, then it gets protected. Um, and ever since then, money is speech in the political realm. It opposed speech rights to the anti-corruption interest or other interests in civic society. So they're seen as opposite to each other, which isn't very good for our anti-corruption interest over here. Um, if you think of other kinds of interests, the kinds of interests I, I talked about the court talking about interest versus child. Um, it, uh, as a separate matter, it talks about bribery laws as, as separate from campaign finance laws. That's a pet peeve of mine. Um, campaign finance laws are anti-bribery laws. Um, so when the court strikes down uh, campaign finance laws, they're saying states cannot pass bribery laws. All bribery laws are really, really hard to enforce. You always need right line rules to make them enforceable. That's another talk for another day. Um, anyway, for the next 26 years, the debate is framed by Buckley um, and framed with this sort of growing consensus around um, the First Amendment and the First Amendment as the, as the heart of the Constitution. So, <laughs> I want to compete. In Citizens, so in Citizens United, Kennedy sort of dresses up the First Amendment as this wise elder. He talks about the ancient principles of free speech. And um, uh, says we have to give the benefit of any doubt to protecting free speech concerns. So basically what he's saying and admitting to is once free speech is mentioned, I'm going to put my blinders on, it's no longer going to be a balancing of all kinds of different concerns. Free speech is the trump card. Um, and within it, I mean, one of the things that I think is disturbing is there's little alternate political theory to balance it. So it doesn't talk too much about like what politics is about, what politics is for, what political life is like. Um, instead, it talks very abstractly about speech. So what's wrong with this uh, free speech era that we're in? Uh, the first, I think, of course, is what we've seen with um, super PACs, and we have yet to see what's going to happen there. This is the, you know, this is the amateur hour this year on super PACs. Um, this is like the television was invented two years ago. So, and let's, uh, television was invented two, two years ago, and there's a bunch of money for new TV ads. 
Um, so there's a lot of money this year in super PACs, but they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to reach people. Uh, they don't know how to most effectively use money as outside money. They're just making it up as they go along. And uh, one signal of that is um, most super, disproportionate super PAC money is coming from Texas, uh, which is, <laughs> it sounds wrong. But what I mean is that it's from Rove's friends so far. It's not from um, uh, Wall Street. And I am much more concerned about long term about systemic use of money in politics, uh, outside money, super PAC money by Wall Street and other industry interests than I am about rich eccentrics. Not that I like the rich eccentrics, but, um, but that far more concerning is really systemic use. As the Supreme Court in 1871 said, if the great corporations of our day were to hire adventurers to make market of themselves, every right-minded person would denounce it as immoral. Um, a second problem, and this actually relates very closely to Arden, is that right? Um, is that it takes away from the public the most difficult political questions. So, tell me if I'm saying this wrong, Roger, but I think of Arden as saying politics is what happens when people come together and say, what should we do? Um, and the question of what should we do is a really, really hard one, and the Supreme Court has kicked it out of some of our most difficult questions. We live in an era where information is power, in this country in particular. Data, um, management, man ownership of data and management of information is power. So if you would tie ownership and management of information is power, plus information has to be free no matter what, together, you have power is going to be free no matter what. We don't have any way of managing Google or Facebook or the um, data controlled by various other large corporate powers. I don't know the answer to that question, but I'd rather have it publicly than have it be cut off and kicked out of discussion by the Supreme Court. So I want to end um, by talking about what I think is one of the real challenges to the liberal political vision, which is lobbying. Um, so, 1871, the Supreme Court says that it um, cannot be enforced it's against the public policy of the United States. I don't know what the right answer is there, but I think it is a challenge because, um, on the one hand, it is incredibly important to be able to petition government, incredibly important for groups of people to come together and organize and petition, perhaps with a paid agent. On the other hand, a lobbyist job is to take money and be an alchemist and turn that money into power. And as lobbyists, they do it through the medium of information and reason, but turning money into reason is actually a very scary thing for a political society. Um, I mean, the old folks would call it sophistry. By old, I mean thousands of years old. Um, that there's something very dangerous about living in a society where people can be paid um, and can be paid to turn that money into information which itself uh, is, is transported into power. And what that means, because, so 1871 case absolutely overruled, uh, lobbying is absolutely protected, um, and because the Supreme Court has taken it out, we don't have an active scholarly discussion about lobbying. People don't talk about lobbying too much. The left and the right both sort of shut their eyes about it. The left, because if you say I might want to limit lobbying, that sounds like you're stepping on the First Amendment. Um, and so, although there's some discussion of how horrible it is, we don't have an active public discussion about how we think lobbying should work and how it shouldn't work. That's the kind of discussion I think we should have, and the Supreme Court has taken out of the public's hands. Um, I, and I, I, I guess the one last thing I want to say about that is that it's somewhat ironic that the First Amendment is ended up using, being used to shut down effectively some questions that I think we should be having publicly. Um, so what should we do? Um, what most of my scholarship is around sort of building a different vision of what the Constitution is and what the Constitution is for. 
Um, I think that the uh, sort of if you look at both the founding era and up through the 1920s, you'll see a story of the Constitution being for representative government to more than for free speech. And I think we should return to that. And that the core foundation of that is an anxiety, um, very sort of dark vision of uh, concentrated power always threatening self-government. And so then the job um, of us as citizens, the job of the court is to help in that battle so that there's self-government can be possible. Um, and then the second thing we should do is to um, challenge the orthodoxy, be willing to show some skepticism towards the First Amendment um, and understand the broader tradition it came out of and understand ways that we might um, possibly limit it. Um, at this point, I think I'd like to open up for questions, discussion. Thanks.
That's why. Say, say you had to re argue, you would have the opportunity to re argue Citizens United yes. tomorrow in court. I mean, I have a couple questions. Would you strategically think, well, I have to bring in the First Amendment? If you didn't, how would you argue it? And if you did, how would you, how would you argue that? Um, it's funny you asked. <laughs> No, I, had, I wrote this article that was sort of directly related to that. I would argue first, I would absolutely use the first amendment because you can't avoid it. <laughs> so that's there. But separately, that there's another incredibly strong American pr political tradition um, that goes back to the founding, which is concern with corruption. Corruption was mentioned more often than any other um, concern during the Constitutional Convention. Uh, Hamilton said, when he was later asked what was the convention about, he said, well, um, we'd put every practicable obstacle we could to corruption. So that first I would try to identify with a separate tradition, and then the second thing I would do, which relates to your question, is I'd try to make it as concrete as possible. So uh, then future Justice Kagan argued the Citizens United decision, Elena Kagan, and I don't think she, she did a very good job. <laughs> Do I have to record all this? I guess so. Um, <laughs> um, and part of it is because it was so abstract. So that if you get into a, this happens in my classes, if you just talk about free speech in the abstract, free speech wins. But if you say, okay, you're a Congress member. Goldman Sachs says, I don't like the financial transaction tax. Let's talk about the federal bribery laws that cover it. It turns out they don't. Like, let's talk practically, practically about what every other protection is. There aren't any. You, by the way, Supreme Court, have knocked down and limited federal bribery statutes as well. Um, on, so, so don't have a fantasy that there's some white knight prosecutor out there who's going to be able to go get Goldman Sachs for this, just saying, I don't like financial transaction tax. So really try to make it real for them what politics is. Because I actually think they're really naive. I think that they, they believe that um, politics feels like a market square, and it doesn't. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little confused. I, I read Citizens United a little different than the um, Don't you think there's two problems to the case? There's, there's bad law, which yes. is what Scalia was saying, that there's a 30-day arbitrary rule, which he struck down. He said, you can't live his speech in this 30-day period. And, in a sense, you have the equal protection clause. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you can argue free speech, but how can you argue a bad law? So, um, broadly put, the question is, how do you stop, I, I, I'll just rephrase it, how do you stop bribery? Given that, um, and by bribery you mean that there's some kind of threat or promise of spending money in exchange for some policy decision. Of public officials. You don't want to put it that way? That's not what I'm saying. Okay, so saying. Then I to, I'll get back to it and I'll see okay. if I answer your question. So what Congress did is we can either look, do a really vague law that says we're going to look case by case, but then gives enormous discretion to prosecutors, or we're going to do a bright line rule. And the bright line rule says 30 days. Um, and with 30 days, we have the advantage of not giving enormous discretion to prosecutors. Um, having everybody know exactly what the law is and exactly what the law isn't, and if they follow this law, it's fine, if they don't follow this law, it's fine. It, the, uh, the reason I put it in that context is that bribery laws are really hard. Citizens United decided the same year as Skilling, um, the Enron case, where the Supreme Court struck down a bribery law for vagueness. So on the one hand, they say you can't have it vague, on the other hand, they say you can't have it bright line. So that's the context I would put it in. I do think there are other um, very real hard arguments in Citizens United. I, I can tell you what I think Kennedy's best argument is, if you're curious. Sure. Um, it's so good, and he does it so badly, but if he did it well, it's somewhat devastating. It's that he says, I don't know the difference between Ford Motor Company and the New York Times. I don't. They're both corporations. And a lot of times, Ford Motor Company owns the New York Times. Right? And a lot of times, Ford Motor Company has its own press. It, uh, go to, go to um, Exxon's webpage right now. It has news. So if I can't tell the difference between the New York Times and Ford Motor Company, and you let me outlaw corporate independent speech, you're gonna, that means that you, you can outlaw um, the New York Times too. And uh, until you tell me how to tell the difference between press and not press, I don't want to go down that road. I think that's a devastating argument. 
Can I ask you about that? Yeah. Um, because I actually think it is a devastating argument, and I don't think you need to oppose it. Right? I mean, there's a different, I mean, so much of these Citizens United discussion yeah. has gone about corporations. Yeah. Right? Corporations, are, why should corporations have free speech? I mean, I forget the exact case, but there was that Massachusetts case mm -hmm. that allowed unions, right, to, mm -hmm. to, um, to make arguments. Massachusetts for life, yes. yes. Yeah. And, 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 and the argument there was, okay, there's individual union members, but unions are part of our political sphere, right. and they should have a voice. Mm -hmm. And you can make the same very good argument for corporations. But your argument against Citizen United, as I understood it, was not about what I liked about it from when I read it, was forget the corporation issue. Yeah. What it's really about is there was this value that from the founding up to the 19 whatever, in which whether it's corporations or individuals, little, little Mr. Child Absolutely. sitting there, you know, Mr. Old Man, right? You can't that there is a there is, that the fundamental value protecting freedom in this country was anti-corruption, yeah. and that we've shifted our political theory from saying we need to keep it non-corrupt political sphere to have a democracy to having a free speech for individual and so then you can accept Kennedy's yeah. argument and yeah. say that the real argument is not about corporations or individuals it's about the sh the, the, the the loss of the anti-corruption yeah. aspect and that yeah. I think that's right and also I don't think uh, in these difficult questions I don't think the court should decide that. So can you just I mean you did a little of it can you do a little bit more I mean Bring out the anti-corruption argument. I mean, let's say you were going to take Joe's question and make you know make your argument. Right. What is the anti? What is the political theory behind the anti-corruption argument? That people should not use public office for private gain, and public office includes being a citizen. So when you are acting as a citizen, you should not use it for private gain. Um, and that this is the uh, death of republic. It's the end of Rome, which has very much influenced the founding. Um, they're very concerned about what they saw in Britain, which is that people were going into office to get to make money for themselves, uh, and had a very strong political culture that wasn't had, didn't have a civic culture that the United States did. And so then the Constitution includes a whole suite of protections um, against this. When they talked about election, they talked about corruptions. When they talked about residency, seven-year residency requirement, they talked about corruption. When they talked about Akhil Amar has argued that when they talked about um, not allowing people to be congressmen until a certain age, we don't have a textual source for this, but that was an anti-corruption provision because you didn't want dynasties, son, 21-year-old sons, to be able to come in. Um, there's a provision in the Constitution, the snuff box, when you mention the snuff box, <laughs> that says uh, you may not, uh, officer of the United States may not accept a gift of any kind, whatever, from a foreign prince or uh, a head of state, um, for absolutely because of fears of um, corruption and sort of change dependencies. Um, the Electoral College was in part, uh, came back as a fear of corruption because at the time it took so long to travel from state to state that Madison said it's going to be too hard to organize buying all the votes in the presidency um, if you have different states having their own electoral uh, college system. And, oh no, not the electoral college, the fact that it's all held on one day. Because why you can have elections held on lots of different days, but all on one day means it's going to be too hard to organize. Um, the uh, veto, ugh, they talked endlessly about the veto power as an anti-corruption principle because they were worried that the um, president would buy up the um, uh, veto plus one votes in the Senate because they wanted to make sure the veto was small enough that the president couldn't buy the um, veto plus one votes. So it was just a constant theme. Those are the kinds of arguments that I made. And it persisted for 150 years. So there's some people who say, yeah, that's what they did, but they were these weird idealists, and that isn't workable. But actually, we went 150 years with this idea that if our constitution's for anything, it's for limiting the twin threats, the two threats to a country. Violence and corruption. Outer threat, inner threat. Everybody accepted this twin threat theory up until the um, 30s or 40s. Other? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, with the. Because we're kind of looking back in. Yeah. Development. With the Sedition Act, 
and then the espionage, yes. and this development of free speech, and then McCarthyism, yes. and then you know symbolic expression. Yeah. We turn away. We, we we keep making these turns with free speech, and now we're citizens united. Yeah. What do you think will be next? Do you think? I mean, the developer, you know, because I don't want to say. Do you think we're gonna rule down Citizens United and no. change everything? Because it doesn't seem like you think that. Well, it's because it, where we're gonna be ends up depending an enormous amount on the justices and right. the country. Um, and, but it does actually end up mattering depending on the you know, who the academics are who move up. And what do you they think, think we'll stick down this road? Do you think what? Do you think we'll stay down this road? That I, well, I think we're on it right now. Yeah. The um, Two district courts recently struck down provisions that have been fairly long-standing that um, prohibited lobbyists from uh, sort of had revolving door statutes that were right. prohibited based on Citizens United. Uh, the other one was prohibited lobbying lobbyists from giving money to campaigns. Um, so at least the, when they're reading the tea leaves, they're saying we're going farther down that road. Mm -hmm. um, the same group that argued Citizens that pushed Citizens United is pushing for. Um, against disclosure, saying that it is a violation of your First Amendment rights to have uh, campaign contributions disclosed. Um, all this can change with a different court, um, but also with a different public ideology. I do think the you know, public ideology seeps in. And you know, I want to retain a free speech value, but not... Okay. I mean, what we saw with... I'm glad you mentioned McCarthyism, is that um, you know, a colleague of mine says we're always fighting the last battle, and we're fighting McCarthyism, when that isn't the problem in contemporary society. Um, or you, you may think it is. Well, not, not in the same extent. Not the same, yeah. Well, well just yeah. Yeah, I'll push on that. I mean, yeah. what's the difference between the free speech right that protects against this McCarthyism and the free speech right as it's expressed by Citizens United and Kennedy that says political speech can't be be, be, be regulated and crossed. I mean, how do you articulate the difference? Well, well, within the context of the court, I would argue this way, which is that when it's content-based, and that's tricky, but when it's based on a particular point of view, right. then it's extremely dangerous. When it's not based on a particular point of view, then sometimes it can be dangerous, like the Sedition Act. So you can say those aren't point of view act, or they are, but I still think they're point of view. Whereas in the, uh, now Kennedy clearly thinks in Citizens United, he thinks that the people who pass campaign finance have a point of view, and their point of view is anti-corporate. And that there is a, he doesn't rest on it, but he clearly thinks there's a content, the idea is that uh, the most um, critically looked upon laws are laws that say, thou shalt not, um, be anti-abortion or shall not be pro-abortion. The laws that say what, what the content of what you're saying um, is uh, criminalized as opposed to the fact of some kind of speech. Uh, but I think that's where I would draw the line, and I would have a little more trust that courts can work that out. Yeah, um, you mentioned something about um, kind of reviving this idea of representational government, or you yeah. said something about it, but um, if the concept of speech has changed so much to the point where money is now speech and, you know, if you donate money to, like, a terrorist organization, money is now material aid, is now speech, you can draw this line. How do you, I mean, don't you feel that the nature of representation itself has kind of been changed in a way that it, reviving it is not as simple as it may sound? Like what, I guess, what do you think post-Citizens United is the nature of representation? Um, in politics, and is there some kind of new representation you would want to go for? I mean, I mean, you had brought up so many interesting things, including the material aid stuff. It's really interesting, because one way to think about it is that there's a view, view of the First Amendment, which is the First Amendment is used to deregulate. It's used as an unregulating tool, except in areas of terrorism, yeah. <laughs> where we have a, a, a maybe a different First Amendment, and that's a little logically inconsistent. Um, but what I care about, I don't know this answer, is what I care about is that people have power to um, answer questions in their lives like, how should we live? And they have it in some meaningful sense. Um, and so the representation I care about is that, it's not representation for its own sake, but representation for power. Um, and I, 
I guess I wish the court talked about more about power, not just representation, which is. Um, but I don't know that I entirely understand your question. I mean. Well, it just seems that. Yeah, it's it's a very jumbled question, and it's kind of vague in my mind. But um, it seems like part of the problem, especially because, like Kennedy's argument, you can't tell the difference between New York Times as a corporation and Ford yeah. as a corporation, even though one is producing information. Mm -hmm. And it seems like information is exactly what a political representative wants to represent. You know, the speech or the information or whatever from their constituency, but. Um, if we're in a place where now what would be represented or channeled through representatives is something that has morphed or become oh, yeah. some other thing, then we should have a different name for it. That's interesting. So, like a classic example would be in financial reform. I keep mentioning this. Have any of you heard of the financial transactions tax? Um, so, it's a tax on, you know, like you get a tax on your toothpaste, tax on um, financial transactions. When polled, 73% of the country likes it. These are crazy numbers. As a union friend of mine said, these are numbers so high, it doesn't matter how you message it. Which is very unusual for Washington. <laughs> nobody's, not nobody, but almost nobody's proposing it. It would make political sense in, in, in tight districts. Romney should be proposing it. Um, but because of fear of the financial industry, it's sort of it's outside of the scope, so there's not representation in that area. Is that what you're talking about? Where they're not actually representing the population? Yeah. Uh, I guess so. um, and should we stop calling it representation if it's not? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. It's par partially that language is kind of something that yeah. I think has been confusing. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on whether it's still talk about representation and speech in the same. So in world history, we're doing pretty well. You know, I tend to think that we tend towards oligarchy in political society. Um, we don't quite have one yet, we're moving towards it. And the reason I care so deeply about action now is I feel like we still have a civic culture. And representation is still psychologically possible for, for those of us who are part of that tradition. And so I want to grab onto that and do something about it. But we're in, we're in tricky days. Oh, <coughs> uh, thanks, I love your job. I wanted to hear more about the distinction you were just making before mm -hmm. Janet's question about um, not wanting to police the content mm -hmm. of the speech. And I wonder how that can work. Um, and I don't know, I'm thinking about the Canadians hate speech laws. Yeah. We call it hate speech, and there's a content but also a function involved. Right. So here in the US, when, when what I would as hating would call hate speech happens, it's it's a, no no that's not hate speech, it's my exercise of my right to free speech. Right. Right. So it's it's said to be a practice rather than a, a harmful content. I, I don't know if that's the kind of distinction you're getting at, but it seems to me counterintuitive that after what you've told us now that I would still be willing to police content. <laughs> or that yeah that you don't or not, think, or not police that content. you don't think it can content can be and yeah. I just, I want to know what oh, it's such a great question because I mean, this is a fun talk for me because I haven't really given it before. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, should we really try to think out loud about how far I want to go on the First Amendment? You know, I have some skepticism about the First Amendment, but how far to go? And when Canada and Europe, it doesn't look so bad. You know, it, like what I basically have a view that the Supreme Court should not get involved that often. That there are times like with. Um, uh, segregation, where the Supreme Court absolutely should get involved. But it should be pretty rare, as opposed to a, a regular, I'd always rather have the stupid, crazy public decide things, almost always, than the elite, Harvard-educated group of seven, mm -hmm. group of nine, um, group of five, often. <laughs> uh, so the question is, when, I pose it as, when should there be an exception for that? When should we say that we don't fundamentally trust the public? I fundamentally trust the public more than the group of nine for um, money and politics questions. I don't trust them as on race. Maybe that will change, but right now. And um, when you look at the Sedition Acts, I have this re reaction. Say, I don't trust the public of 1917 on the Anti-Sedition Acts. I think those acts are crazy. So, um, Finding the line um, is really difficult, but I don't think, that when, 
I think shrinking way back would be okay, because I look at Europe and I look at uh, Canada, neither of which have a First Amendment. There's no First Amendment tradition in those countries, uh, in those cultures as well. I don't feel like um, people who wanted to oppose the war are muzzled, or who have different political views are muzzled. Um, so, I, I, what I was using was very classic, showing how socialized I've been, a very classic model, which is content speech versus non-content speech, but I think it's a good question. So, so what is non-content speech? Oh, um, 